great morning. We've had a wonderful day here. That was the sixth or seventh baptism. Six. Okay, six baptism. And uh, today's an important day in the life of our church. Um, we just sent um, about like 80 people, uh, high school students and youth sponsors, to Tulsa, Oklahoma for a youth conference called Christ in Youth. And it, it is, uh, and I'm saying this because this is, uh, this is very important for our church. These uh, students are uh, leaders in our church, in our community, in our schools. And um, some of them are going to make life-changing decisions to follow Christ this week. We just know that. We know that's going to happen. And... Um, and they're going to be leaders in their schools this year, and and uh, it, this is this is important, and we need you to pray about it this week. Um, many of you, uh, in fact, I would tell you, parents, you got to get your kids on this trip. You got to do it. I don't care. Uh, just let me put it this way: think of it like this: an entire week without a high school kid in your house wouldn't that be great? <laughs> How much you can pay for that, right? Uh, well, here's the card. A week? Can we do two weeks? You know, it was like, and so it is. It's uh, powerful. Um, you invest in your kids in lots of ways. I do not know a better way to spend your money on your children's future and faith than uh, in our youth ministry in this way. So you got to do whatever you can. And I know I'll get pushback. Well, my kids in this, you know, these football team, like. I understand, but what is going to help them navigate the halls of Millard North this year? What's going to help them navigate the halls of Millard West? What is going to help them navigate, right, the halls of D.C. West? Um, it's going to take more than the football team. Uh, I know. Well, my kids are cheerleaders. I, un I understand. I understand. I've been there. I've all that stuff. Uh, but this is, this is critical. This is vital. So invest if you can. Next year, it's like, hey, I'll get my kid there. And they may push back. Well, I don't know, I don't know anybody. <laughs> well, within the first 15 minutes of you being squashed in a van next to some person, you will get to know them. <laughs> Very well. Also this week, uh, we've had third through fifth graders at a camp in uh, Fontenelle. They've been enjoying an incredible week there, and, and uh, they, I believe they get home today. And so we're excited to hear the life-changing stories that will take place in the hearts of these young people. And again, uh, again, thank you, parents, for trusting your kids with our uh, uh, youth pas or children's pastors and, and their sponsors and doing that. It's, uh, I think back through my life as a kid growing up. Uh, I, I made more important decisions at camp than in any other time of my spiritual life. It, was, it is that important. And um, thank you for that. All right. Uh, I have never been on a large boat during a storm. I have been on some pretty good sized boats when the waves were really significant. And uh, I've told you about that a few years ago. I was in Alaska on the Kenai uh, Peninsula of Kenai Fjords. And uh, the first 40 minutes of the Kenai Fjord kind of experience is in Resurrection Bay, which is a very calm body of water, huge body of water. And you go back and forth looking at these little spots, trying to find sea things and puffins and stuff. And then you venture out past the bay. And, and uh, this particular day that we were there, the waves were horrible. And it was just pounding us the whole time. And, and you could not find a safe place on that boat. Uh, to get away from all the noise and the, of the retching that was taking place at that moment. And I also contributed to the um, uh, feeding of many fish that day as I chose to use my um, uh, lunch uh, uh, in that capacity. And I remember after throwing up that I thought, uh, how much longer? And I looked at my watch, I had three more hours on the boat. And I made a strategic decision at that moment to jump overboard and swim as best. No, I didn't jump over, but I wanted to. I used to think, how am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to, how am I supposed to survive for the next three hours on this boat? I feel horrible, and I can't get away from it. And just imagine what it would be like to be on a boat for, for, for weeks 
trying to navigate through storms and messes like that. And uh, that's what we find. The Apostle Paul is on a boat heading towards Rome. And uh, he, he didn't really want to be on this boat ride because he knew that the weather was going to get rough. And he warned the folks, we're not supposed to be doing this. This is a bad time of year to sail, and uh, we shouldn't be doing this. They, you know, we, let's stay in Crete where it's nice and calm and everybody's safe and secure. And the folks were like, what do you, who are you? You're a prisoner. You need to be quiet. We know what we're doing. You're not a sailor. We are. We're going. And uh, that's where we pick up this uh, story today uh, that we look at the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27, 13 through 38. Long passage. Hang with me as we read through it. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. That, that little phrase, thought they could make it. How many of us have, like, oh, I thought I could make it. I, I, I remember as a kid, I was riding my bike, and I was at 10 speed, and uh, uh, for some reason, the garage door was kind of halfway down. And I thought, if I just get low enough on my bike, I should be able to make it. And so I scrunched down on my 10 speed and wham, nailed my back right on. There was so loud, my parents come running out of the house. What's going on? And I remember still to this day, the exact words I used. Well, I thought I could make it. Now, how many of us have kind of lived our life like that? It looked, seemed right at the time, thought I could make it, thought it was going to be fine, bam! And, right? and that's what these sailors thought. A little light wind was blowing. Everything seems to be good. All the conditions seem to point out. We got some red flags, but we think this is going to be fine. So they pulled up anchor, and they sailed close to the shore of Crete. All the while, Paul's going, not a good idea. But the weather started getting rough and the tiny ship was tossed. <laughs> but the weather changed abruptly and a wind of typhoon strength called the Northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. So now they're in trouble. Sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up. What's the use? We can't control it. We're, we're at the mercy now of the wind and the waves. We sailed along the sheltered side of a small island named Kata where, the great, where with great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat being to towed behind us. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it, to reinforce it. They, they were afraid of being driven across the sandbars of Sit Sirtis off the African coast, so they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. Next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until all, at last all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> I told you. P parents, you ever say that? You should have listened to me. I told you. Told you. I just think that's kind of funny. <laughs> Here's this prisoner. Told you. All right. Where am I at? Man, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. <laughs> you avoided all this damage and loss. But take courage. None of, this, none of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For the last night, an angel of, of God to whom I belong and whom I have served stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for, uh, I, uh, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, uh, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. About midnight on the 14th night of the storm, as we were being driven across the Sea of uh, Adria, the sailors sensed land was near. They dropped a weighted line and found the water was 120 feet deep. A little later, they measured again, found it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid we would soon be driven across the rocks along the shore, so they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. The sailors tried to abandon the ship. Uh, they lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the sh front of the ship. So they're messing around here. They're going to try to get off, let, let the 
let the rest of the folks die. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes of the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You've been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair on your heads will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, broke off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat. All 276 of us who were on board. After eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo we'd overboard. You know, sometimes all you can do is just pray for daylight, right? Just want hope that it'll happen. It's in those moments of worry and fear come rushing in, restless nights when sleep eludes us. We imagine the worst and our problems get bigger and bigger. And we begin to wonder, how am I going to make it? Things start out so good. Everything seemed to be all right. Now, this was a season when, of, of, of the year when you didn't sail too much because of the storms that, that might pop up. Uh, it was actually October in that region. That, you know, usually they stopped sailing by, the, by September-ish and, and just waited it out. But for whatever reason, there's a little light wind that comes up and they think, hey, maybe we should go for it. Maybe we should just go for it. And so they do. They just like, you know, they get everybody ramped up. We're going, we're going now, we're going now. And Paul's like, no, no, no. And they're like, yes, we're going now. And it gave the, the, it gave the sailors a false sense of hope here. But the weather changed abruptly and they thought they could make it. They had been warned. Have you ever been warned by maybe your friends or Maybe a pastor, maybe a parent that said, no, 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 this is not a good idea. I don't think you should do it. No, 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 this is not a good idea. And you said, I'll be fine. I think I can make it. It seemed like a good idea at the time. It seemed like a good investment at the time. But people were saying, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think you should be doing that. Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Seemed like a good idea. Maybe we should just move to get move in together. That, that seemed like a good idea. Yet yeah, there was some warning signs, little red flags that being popped up. But you kind of like, yeah, I think we'll be fine. Uh, I think that job's going to be awesome. You know, oh, there's some red flags. I'm not sure, but but no problem. I, I think I'll be fine. You ignored. You ignored the advice of some people, some godly people, and you went ahead. Before long, you realize that you're in over your head. You're in trouble and you're caught in a mess. Verse 20 kind of says that the terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. It was so dark. Uh, the storm was so bad. You lost all hope. And my guess is that some of you know that feeling. Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's the tension so uh, dark right now in your home that you have lost all hope. You don't think anything, you, can, you don't think it can be recovered. You know that feeling? You know that feeling of losing hope? I mean, you know, if you're a Cub fan, you know that. You lost hope in May. You're just like, eh, whatever. You know that feeling of losing hope if you're a Miami Heat fan, right? LeBron went to Cleveland, huh? I guess. Why even buy tickets now? Hope is gone. We know that feeling of losing hope. These guys are heading for disaster and they know it and they're hot, tired and hungry and afraid. Verse 27, you know, says, about midnight on the 14th night of the storm, we were being driven across the sea. Uh, the sailors sense, you know, hey, we, we, we're in trouble and we, we, we uh, you know, we're getting close to land and, and that sounds good, you know, but, you know, we're at 120 feet, now we're at 90 and they realize, well, if this continues, our ship is gonna hit rocks and we're gonna die. So they put out four anchors to slow things down. I want to give you today four anchors to kind of slow some stuff down. So when you're in the middle of a storm, you throw out these anchors, and this is what hopefully can give you some time, right, before you run aground. First one is, the first anchor is you need to pay attention to, to the physical side of your life. Notice that these guys hadn't eaten for two weeks uh, you need uh, to take care, you know, I know people are like, well, wait a minute, I thought we were, you know, this is where I come get my spiritual stuff. And it's like, ah, physical. Um, but I have people all the time who come in my office who are, 
in a dark spot, and it's not because of their spiritual life. In fact, they would say, spiritually, this is the best I've ever been. I, I, am doing, I feel like I'm doing really well with God, but I'm stuck. It's dark, and, and I can't, and so we'll talk about, well, are, are you getting in enough exercise, and have you been to the doctor, and you, you know, have you, are you eating well? And, uh, and oftentimes the answer is, well, I, I, no, I sleep terrible, and um, I know I eat poorly, and I don't exercise, and okay, well, maybe the most spiritual thing you can do today is you need to make an appointment with a doctor. You need to go to get things, some things checked out. And uh, begin to deal with maybe your medication. Are you on a new medication? Maybe that's got you messed up. And you begin to take a look. Well, maybe it's a physical thing that, that, uh, that you need to take care of. And we need to take care. Because I might be clicking really well with God. My emotional life is okay. But my physical life is all out of whack. So don't ignore that. That's the first anchor you need to take a look at. Second anchor is you need to lighten the load. These guys were throwing some stuff off the boat that was not essential for their survival. They're getting rid of some of the excess stuff there, and they knew that less would be more if they were going to make it. The, the extra weight was dragging them down. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has before us. For hope to be restored to these folks, they said, you know, we got to lighten the load. Let's get rid of some stuff. And you know, if you want to climb a mountain, that weight is certainly important. That You, wanna have, you don't want to have more weight than you need to climb up a mountain. Yes, there's some stuff you need to be able to survive that trip and up and down. But you, you want to lighten the load. You go to Backwoods, a store here in town for camping. The, it's incredible. All the stuff they have there that's super light and super expensive. The lighter it is, the more expensive it seems to be. Why? Because it is important to lighten the load. You don't want to carry excess stuff. So you might have your backpack. It's going to be kind of weird. Uh, you know, we've got two teams that are going climbing mountains this year up in Colorado. One team already did 14,000 footer. And so, you know, the... Uh, it'd been really weird for those guys. To, hey, I got my stuff and this stuff. Uh, and by the way, uh, 30 pounds uh, of dumbbells I'm also going to carry up here because I want to work out. What? And, and you know, and so, and after a, a thousand feet of that, you're going, well, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. And you just start chucking stuff. You know, like, I'm, taking, I'm getting rid of this stuff. A couple years ago, Linda and I went to see the U.S. swim tr trials. Uh, Ryan Lochte is there and Michael Phelps, and we're super excited to see it. And I was super surprised that when they got out on the blocks that they had very little clothing on. Oh, how come they're not wearing a life vest? Well, that'd be really stupid, right? Why are they not wearing an overcoat? Well, that'd be dumb. No, they had very little on. In fact, I had a difficult time getting the binoculars away from Linda. Whoa. Can I see? No. In order for them to swim faster, they had to have less on. They were going to carry more stuff on there. And yet, Christ followers, we have all this. In fact, it can be good stuff that we carry around. It's just this weighing us down. It might be your work. And occasionally, if you catch yourself saying this, well, I'm just too busy to. Yeah, you know, work so busy. I'd like to do that, but it's just right now, it's just too busy. Well, that's a good thing, but sometimes we have to say, well, what am I going to do about that in order for me to have the best climb, right? The best climb or the towards where I want to go with my life. I must be constantly asking myself, will this move me ahead for the things that I dream of or will this weaken my faith? Because weak legs don't cross very many finish lines. 1 Corinthians 10.23 says, uh, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, well, I'm, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. And, and sometimes we, I talk with Christ followers and say, well, you got to get rid of that. Well, it's not illegal. Well, yeah, uh, but, or it's not, you know, the Bible doesn't say I can't. Mm, yeah, I know, but it's really messing you up in your marriage. Yeah, but you can't tell me. I'm just telling you, you got to get rid of some excess stuff. 
No, it's not illegal. It's just messing you up. It's slowing you down. It's causing problems. Why wouldn't you get rid of that? Acts 27, 32. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and left it drift away. Even the lifeboat was going to co- could cause them to die. So they, they cut the ropes. And can you imagine watching that drift away going, uh, I think we've done something really stupid. But it was going to save their lives. So take a look in your life. In fact, in, in fact, it, here it says that uh, uh, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. There's some sin in our lives that trip us up all the time, right? And if I was to ask you today, what is the sin that easily trips you up? You would write it down. You know it. And, and you would, right? Well, what are you going to do about that? deal with that so get rid of some stuff lighten the load second anchor third anchor is you need to pray Paul offered a prayer of of thanksgiving in the midst of this mess he had some bread says it's time to eat we're going to eat and he breaks the bread says let's eat well first let's talk to God so they gave he gave a prayer of thanksgiving Philippians 4 6 says don't worry about anything yeah right that's what I usually want to say right after that verse don't worry about it. Yeah, right. I mean, how, oh, yeah, this is the guy that, you know, the, the same guy that's in the boat that wrote these words. He didn't have a peace-filled life. He didn't have a resurrection bay kind of life. He had a life that usually involved a lot of storms. So here he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, what? Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. First Thessalonians 5.18 says, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. I, I don't think the circumstances is God's will. I think the thankfulness is the will of God. So here I'm in the midst of a storm. Paul stops and prays. Bill Hybels writes in his book, Too Busy to Pray, which, by the way, is a great little book to pick up. It's not very big. It, 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 I, I run to that book occasionally because it just is, is very insightful on prayer. Too busy, not, uh, too busy to pray, right? Several years ago, he writes, my father, still a relatively young man and extremely active, died of a heart attack. As I drove to my mother's house in Michigan, I wondered how I would continue to function without the person who believed in me more than anyone else ever has or ever will. That night in bed, I wrestled with God. Why? Why did this happen? How can I put it all together in my mind and in my life? Am I going to recover from losing my dad? And by the way, God, if you really loved me, how could you do this to me? Suddenly, in the middle of the night, everything changed. It was as if if I had turned the corner and was now facing a new direction. God simply said, I am able. I am enough for you. Right now, you doubt this, but trust me. He says, that experience may sound unreal, but its results were unmistakable. After that tear-filled, despairing night, I was never again tortured by doubt, either about God's care for me or my ability to handle life without dad. Grief. Yes, his death wounded me deeply, and I will always miss him. But it did not set me adrift without an anchor or without a compass. If you could ask God for a miracle in your life, knowing that he would hear and he would grant your request, what would you ask for? Well, to put my marriage back together. I pray that my straying child would come back home. I pray that my body could be healed. I pray that my financial mess that I've got myself into would be solved. I pray that, uh, that my, my best friend would come to Jesus. Most of us have to admit that we don't oftentimes pray about our deepest needs. We get discouraged, it gets dark, we pray a little prayer, and then we, we kind of think, well, how come it didn't get solved? And we reach out to God um, only to get into his arms and then fight him. You know, like there's a, sometimes you, you hold a little baby and they're like, and you, you know that they're just exhausted and tired, but they're fighting you the whole way. And you know the best thing for them to do is to what? 
Stay in your arms and relax. And you're trying, you're doing whatever you can. You're rocking, you're singing. But they're like, oh, get me out of here. And how many of us are like that? We're just like, no, no, and let go. And, and he just, at that moment, wants to hold you close. And you just got to go, okay, I just need to relax and, and let him hold me for just a little while. That's what prayer is, is letting God hold us for just a little while. Psalm 62, 8 says, Oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. God is our refuge. Don't fight him. Relax. So the third anchor is prayer. Take it to him in prayer. If you don't, you will think about it, and you will worry about it. So if you got time, I've said this before, if you got time to worry, you obviously have time to pray. Last anchor. And this may seem strange, but uh, you need to jump in now. The Apostle Paul says, okay, let's go, let's jump. And they all jump off the boat right before the boat is, is, is going to smash into the rocks, and they jump and they swim to shore. It's time for action. They'd eaten, they'd lightened the load, they'd prayed, now it was time to jump in. We pray about our finances, but we don't do a budget. We pray about our marriage, but we won't go to a counselor. We pray about our friends who are far from Christ, but we never invite them to church. We pray about our friend who's an alcoholic, but we won't bring up the subject. Perhaps the miracle happens not, not, during the, 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 not during the lighting of the load and not during the uh, prayer time and not during the, you know. It, 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 the miracle happens when we decide to jump. The miracle happens when God parts the waters and we walk across the Red, you know, we, we walk across through the Red Sea. It takes, it, it happens, the miracle happens when we take the step of faith. Not we stand and go, hope it gets better. What does a step of faith require? Two things. And this will blow your mind. Faith and a step. Now, oftentimes, we do really good on the faith thing. We're like, yeah, I believe God. Yeah, God's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm staying in the boat. Because it seems really dumb to get out of a boat during a storm, right? It's really ridiculous. Why would we get out of the boat now? Mm. Well, because that, that's a big rock. <laughs> okay, die. And so if you're going to like, oh, I need, uh, I'm, I'm really struggling with my finances and I prayed about it, but, but I've never taken a course on it and never, you know, the time for prayer is, stop, is to stop now and you need to take action. Well, my marriage, okay, now's the time for action. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, it's just, that's right, it's a scary step. And I'm sure the moment they jumped out of the boat, they thought, this is the dumbest thing we've ever done. And then they started swimming, and they grabbed a hold of a piece of a wood, and they just kept going, and they floated, and they all survived, and they got to the island, they stayed there until the storms were gone, and they could sail to Rome. Now, I don't know where you're at at this time, but maybe you just need to take a step of faith today. I mean, the step might be, I need, to go, I need to be baptized. I think that's the first step I need to do. Maybe this first step towards financial you know, uh, stuff is to say, I, I think my first thing I'm supposed to do is do a budget. I need to give. I bet if I start giving, if I, if I lived on 10% less, I probably would rearrange my, life, my budget so that I could live like that instead of living the way I'm doing it. It takes a step, step of faith. All right. You can sort that out, but I would say now is the time to jump in. All right. Father God, at this moment, we pause here. I know there's some people here this weekend that are, everything's dark. There is no light. You're, they're praying for daylight, and it's not happening. And there doesn't seem to get any better. Um, and they're losing hope. And so today, perhaps at this moment in time, for this, such a time as this, that they were here today to see and hear the, this message. Uh, We do, we do want to be faith-filled people. We want to be hope-filled people. 
And so before we, um, before we um, lose all hope, or you know, some of us need to do some stuff physically to help us get our body and our mind together here on this stuff. And we need to do some taking a look inside of our hearts and our lives as some excess stuff that we need to get rid of, some dangerous things that we're doing. talk to you more, quit wrestling with you, and just relax. Some of us just need to dive in today, take some action, and move forward. All right. In Christ's name we pray, amen.